Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're listening in the world, and welcome to this first in our infrastructure intelligence series of webinars on the uh, issue of coming out of uh, COVID. Uh, the first event in, in this series is entitled, with the easing of the lockdown, what is the new normal for construction? Now that phrase, the new normal, has been often spoken about in our industry and indeed beyond it, uh, in relation to how things might shape up, both from a business point of view, from a societal point of view, after we, or as we start to move out of the immediate effects of the uh, COVID-19 crisis. And we have a panel assembled here um, this morning, because we are all, I believe, in the UK here, uh, to discuss some of those questions and what that new normal might mean for the construction and, uh, and infrastructure uh, sector. Um, we have uh, on our panel today, um, Georgia Hughes from Arcadis. We've got uh, Hannah Vickers from the Association for Consultancy and Engineering. We have Matt Blackwell from Costain and Mark Coates from Bentley Systems. Mm -hmm. uh, the format of uh, today's event will be that they all speak um, and hopefully inform uh, our audience. Um, throughout the uh, the webinar, we will have the questions box that will be open, which you can post your questions, and I will then ask um, our um, speakers some of those questions as we go on. Um, we think with well, we'll definitely be finished uh, by 12:30 uh, at the absolute uh, latest. So that's basically how things are uh, are actually going to uh, to run um, this morning. Um, first up. Um, our speaker, uh, first speaker, is Georgia Hughes. Georgia is a senior management consultant at the um, multidisciplinary consultancy, uh, global consultancy, Arcadis, and she's also chair of ACE's uh, Young Professionals Network, the ACE Emerging Professionals. So I would hope uh, that Georgia will be able to give us uh, quite an interesting perspective on what might that new normal be, and particularly. Uh, dare I say it, how people from the emerging professionals generation actually see things uh, going forward as well. So without further ado, I'll hand, hand it over to Georgia to, uh, to give us uh, a few words. Georgia, over to you. Thank you, Andy. Yes, so as Andy said, I'm a senior management consultant at Arcadis, uh, sort of specialising in change management and specifically with people, but also with a, um, a keen interest in sustainability for the infrastructure sector. The emerging professionals are a part of um, ACE's network. We are approximately 130, 000, uh, 1,300 strong, based in uh, four different all the regions within the UK, so London, South East, Midlands, North West, North East, Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland. Typically, we're about sort of where those within the first 12 years of their career or up to roughly the age of 35, but anyone's welcome to join in with our networks and sort of come and participate along with that. Historically, emerging professionals, some of you might know them as the, as the um, progress network, we hold events at regional levels and provide opportunity and growth for individuals in order to be able to sort of develop their own personal and professional skills. Since the launch of the ACE's Future of Consultancy campaign back last year, we have been working on uh, our own sort of side piece to that, which is the future of the workplace and what that will look like and how we as the emerging professionals and the future of the industry can sort of develop what that will look like and, and how we can develop it through. What we have come up with through that is since October, we've been looking at holding, we've done several pieces of research, uh, both with the emerging professionals themselves, but also much more broadly into industry. And this has been very much sort of a market analysis and development of a thought piece through that to be able to support emerging professionals in understanding what's important both now and in the future, but also ensuring that we can develop and nurture that talent that we have within that sort of younger generation to push it through. We completed our first phase of research back in October of last year and sort of very much looking around three core themes, which includes sort of the forces that are shaping the future of consultancy in the workplace moving forwards, what the attitudes of emerging professionals are to work and it, what, what the culture of the workplace should be. So I'm sure as, as we're all sort of uh, very aware now, the workplace has hugely shifted since October of last year. And we've now all suddenly very all suddenly moved from being very office based to now working from home. 
and that's meant sort of a huge step change in the way our workplace is and, and what that looks like and, and, and how that is developing coming through. So what we've started to do and what we've launched is uh, phase two of our work, uh, sort of our workplace for the future, which is very much around looking at how we develop the culture of the workplace whilst engaging and developing emerging professionals as we move forward. And a big part of this is looking at how the workplace can support in leading that infrastructure revolution, that once in a generational opportunity to really shift the transformation of both the infrastructure sector and, and as a part of that, the um, construction sector as well. So sort of using the situation that we're all in the moment to provide that leverage, what do we think, sort of looking at kind of how we think the twin strategies are that are going to be sort of moving forwards. And that's very much sort of, I think what we all want to see, particularly from my cohort, but I know others as well, is that net zero really needs to be at the front of the agenda as we start to move out of lockdown. We can't just look to kind of step out and go back to where we were. We need to be looking at how we can move and, and, and progress that forwards. But we also need to kind of look at how we can how, how we develop that so it's not just a push from ourselves but we need to be encouraging in, encouraging the government to provide that pull for us to be able to drive and sort of create that that revolution that is needed to move forward in, in order to create that new normal that we're all going to step into there's a huge sense that in, in, in order to do that what we can't have and what i'd be a big advocate for is that we need to ensure that we're retaining the skills and the talent at that emerging level we can't slip back to where we were at the end of the 20, uh, sort of after the 2008 crash where we lost a lot of that that talent that was there because it was sort of makes sense and we were looking at cost cutting and trying to recuperate some of our losses is redundancy and what we will end up with is we will have a skills and talent gap in the market which we won't be able to ever bring back because those individuals will move off to different sectors particularly sort of some of those moving in into the tech side of things which we so desperately need in the infrastructure sector and in construction to develop that moving forwards as a part of the workplace in terms of how we're looking at that developing is a recognition that we need to be a lot more agile we've all successfully proven that we can work from home albeit it's perhaps not as productive as it would be if we were in the office but companies need to start looking at, at how we can provide that mechanism for people to have that development moving forwards. In order to do that, there are several options we could take. Do we go down the routes of some of the big tech and, and banking firms? Do we start to look at you know, working from home being what people do when you opt in to come into the office? Do we give people the opportunity to you know, work from home consistently and just partake in, in, in meetings one-to-one, -one. granted very different for the construction sector where you need to have people on site monitoring and reviewing and understanding as you're building it. Or, you know, do we look to perhaps, you know, move down to the routes that New Zealand have done and as sort of start to become maybe advocate for a four day week? Could that be an option? It was sort of look to improve people's work-life balance considerably, increase tourism, increase revenue, but that would obviously have knock-on effects in terms of how we start to build and come out of this and what we need to be able to develop our infrastructure and, and construction industry forwards. I think from, from my perspective and, and, and a view that's shared by all sort of the majority of the emerging professionals that I speak to is that this needs to be approached this moving out of lockdown needs to be approached not just from the very top of our organisations, not just from the sort of the C-suite, the senior management, but everybody needs to partake in, in what that move out from lockdown will look like. And how do you engage your staff in that? Because as you move through the sort of the change curve, the Kubler-Ross change curve, you sort of come out of up into that denial and then up into acceptance and, and moving forwards your staff, your employees, your people won't move through that, that with you unless they feel like they've been a part of that journey. And the only way they can be a part of that journey is if you are truly reaching out to them and understanding what it is that they want to move forward. And I think that we we should not we shouldn't forget net zero. Prior to all of this, prior to COVID and everything that's happened through this, there was a huge push for net zero. There were lots of pledges made, lots of commitments made to 2025 and, and 2050. And that's still something that we still need to be looking for in sort of the next two to three years time is how do we get that push to being truly net zero rather than it just, what you could sort of see happening happening is rather than it just becoming sort of a, a tick box exercise or something that's just, just, just given words to in order to be able to push and move it forwards. We need to 
understand and decide and discuss as an industry how we embed that in the design aspects in the in the planning aspects and within construction as well to deliver that truly holistic net zero building thank you Thank you very much indeed, uh, Georgie, for that. I think some really interesting points that you've raised there, actually, um, and, and a number of issues that I'm sure will come out, um, hopefully, from the questions as well from the floor, the whole issue of talent retention. Where do we go with that, particularly if there's a recession? Net zero, absolutely crucial issue, I think, going forward for the industry. And also the new shape of the office, you know, and how do we get there? and staff engagement and interest in what you said there about New Zealand and the four day week, which is, I know has been in the, uh, in the national uh, and international media uh, lately. So actually quite a lot of things there for us to potentially come back to in the, uh, in the discussion. And we're already getting some questions coming through, which is great. Um, so do keep your questions coming um, throughout um, the, uh, this first session. Um, our next speaker um, is Mark Coates, who is the strategic Industry Engagement Director for Bentley Systems. Now, Bentley Systems are a leading organization supplying software solutions uh, to the construction sector. And I think as we all uh, will recognize, the last couple of months during the course of this crisis have seen an absolute mushrooming in digital, in the use of technology, as we've all basically, um, I suppose, retreated to, to, to home working and remote working. So I think Mark's perspectives on the current situation uh, I'm sure will be uh, illuminating. So, Mark, over to you. Thanks, Andy. Um, as Andy said, my role with Inside Bentley, I'm very lucky to be one of the few people who gets to look at influences affecting uh, you know, our business and the industry in general. And obviously, the, the, the coronavirus has uh, been a massive uh, sort of impact. And just picking up on, on, on George's earlier comments, you know, before the, uh, the, the pandemic, the office is where millions of us spent about a third of our time. However, since the lockdown, almost half of the UK's workforce said they've been working from home. And some companies have hinted it could become the future. Uh, coronavirus has brought uh, major changes to construction back offices, you know, forced to stay at home. Many office employees have kept business operations running via remote work, relying on technology like video conferencing, collaborative software, emailing, texting, and, uh, and WhatsApp, I believe, as uh, a key source of uh, providing uh, connectivity. And if you look at comments from industry leaders, such as Jeff Stanley, you know, CEO of Barclays, he said that the notion of putting 7,000 people in a building may be a thing of the past, or, or Morgan Stanley CEO, James Gorman, saying that the bank will have much less real estate. And I think it was um, Sir Martin Sorrell who suggested he'd rather invest 35 million he spends on expensive offices and people instead. So is the game up for the office as we know it? Um, fortunately, we might get misty-eyed about it, but I think the office in the form it used to be is probably now from the past. When I was chatting to a client who works for a major design company last week, and he said, we used to have 800 people coming into the office every day. For the last eight weeks plus, we've had 30 people, and productivity hasn't diminished by a great deal. He also did say anyone who thinks go, we are going back to the way things were is bananas. But the most common thread I've heard relating to technology is around Microsoft Teams. You know, the comments being, luckily, we were going to roll out Teams this year, but instead taking 12 months, we did it in eight weeks. And because of the mass usage, you know, people have seen the product develop. For example, I think it was originally it was four people on the screen. It's now nine plus. So however, declaring the end of the office is not as clear cut as that. You know, the radical decrease in the amount of time spent uh, in the office is, you know, can only be expected. But office working will not be over for good. With the recession on the way, people may want to be visible, particularly in times of economic crisis. People start thinking, I want to be in the workplace, the boss needs to see me. But this also may have been one of the cornerstones that held back data adoption that COVID-19 is, is forcibly removed. The world avoids to be job losses, companies you know, dissolving and dramatic changes, including new companies forming as a result of mergers, acquisitions, as companies pool their resources. But there'll also be a tranche of new companies rising to the top of the job market, as the market delivers and fully embraces availability of technology, new and old, 
And I know Bentley is working very closely with companies like Costain uh, on new methods of way of working, you know, enhancing new or old skills, you know. You've always got the, the complex project delivery, but now people are looking at project insights, consultancy and advisory, enhanced asset performance, and finally, you know, digital twins is really raising uh, its profile. Offices will remain as central hubs where senior managers are based, with employees traveling in once or twice a week to meet their bosses or, or meet the team. I mean, that's Twitter's plan. You know, staff can work from home forever, although keeping offices open and you know, people want to come in. But homeworking isn't new. It's been up there in recent decades. Many companies have already been trying to save money on rent and by hiring co-working co space. So cost is going to be a big driver. Uh, and a number of companies have already had a, a change in mindset. You know, we're spending all this money on rent, so why don't we move to home working? COVID-19 has just sort of escalated that speed and the, and the process of change. Firstly, I've spoken to a number of clients both asset owners and project delivery teams with regards to ways of overcoming major issues such as social distancing and um, now how do you use technology to overcome these issues? Once this product actually from the, the Bentley portfolio, Legion, uh, has really come to its, its own. Uh, Legion has the ability to, to simulate and analyse footfall, you know, traffic on assets such as rail, tube, stations, stadiums, office complexes, um, shopping malls and of course airports if we, if we get to use those again. It can be um, actually test design and operation plans so hence footfall, crowd management and, and safety and security strategies. With the new requirements of social distancing, Legion has helped impact the, the changes such as new occupancy levels, barriers, queuing and operational statistics. Um, and Andy, you've already reported, we, we waived subscription fees on, on Project Y365 through to September 30th. We do have some exciting news coming out next week with regards to Legion to help clients analyse their assets, to be better prepared with regards to increased traffic flow on, on both sites and within you know, assets such as offices. And obviously, these are two projects that support asset owners and design team. With regards to site-based projects, a number of key UK contractors have reached out to us with regards to synchro context capture. These are um, they're using Synchro for scheduling, task management to uh, keep ahead of the delivery curve, but work out how deliveries arrive on site, who needs to be in that location. This has already been used before the outbreak by COVID-19 by Tideway and the delivery team on Shard Thames, a pumping station which Crossdain are, are, are part of. It's a very small site and uh, you know, space and, and time is very much limited and it's been used very successfully. And with contact capture, contractors are, are using the reality mesh to work out that the project sits uh, within the programme, and this is all being done remotely. Uh, work is currently underway to combine 4D models with various forms of context capture, from point clouds to photos, and we are looking uh, at what happens when you combine these formats together in the web browser. Uh, and this will enable remote observation, digital tracking uh, of work in place. And there's also been a marked increase in digital twins as asset owners look for new ways of monitoring assets remotely. Uh, iTwins is our, you know, our, our offering and enables you to visualize assets, track change and perform digital analysts to uh, understand and optimize asset performance. Now, as digital twins uh, span the entire asset lifecycle, as users at uh, all stages can make better informed decisions and better outcomes. So much so actually, it will be more of this at, at YAI, uh, our, our annual conference, uh, we're actually uh, going to support the uh, work remote or access data remotely a lot more and better supporting an independent supporting independent software vendors and startups via applications of the iTwin platform with our own iTwin partner program. We aim to foster and thrive ecosystems of organizations to share our vision of central uh, creating an infrastructure of digital twins. Great, thanks. Thanks, Mark, for that. Um, I'm sure that things have been pretty busy for Bentley Systems over the recent period, given the fact that the industry is moving into that, uh, you know, that that new, well, or more so than in the past, uh, technical uh, direction. I mean, speaking of technical directions, our next speaker, uh, with a job title like Digital Operations Director, uh, Matt Blackwell from Costain, will have certainly had his work cut out and a few challenges 
over the last um, two to uh, two to three months, and I'm, I, for one, are absolutely fascinated uh, to uh, to hear about what Matt's got to say um, about things uh, at the present moment in time. So, Matt, over to you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Andy. Uh, just like to say, firstly, hope everybody that's listening is, is staying well, keeping safe. Um, I think a lot of, uh, of what we're experiencing will echo much of what, uh, in particular, what Mark has already said. Um, I think Costain are in a quite uh, privileged situation, really, in that we were very early adopters of a complete cloud approach. Um, we'd already switched over to Azure and Office 365 several years ago, so we were we were quite well positioned in terms of having a cloud-based platform that could be could be accessed from anywhere. And many of us were already working from home, uh, not necessarily enforced like it is now, um, but we were quite used to to the working from home situation. Um, we just started to roll out Teams, uh, interestingly, just before the lockdown struck. So we were already starting to use it. And in fact, we were using it much more as a kind of uh, collaborative area, chat room, uh, file sharing space, rather than a full on communication suite, which obviously we, we are now all doing. Uh, we migrated to Skype very, uh, from Skype, sorry, very rapidly. Um, once it was obvious that we were all going to be working from home uh, for an enforced uh, and unknown amount of time. So we've already switched to Teams. Uh, it's working very, very well. I would say uh, I can't remember a time when I've been so consistently and constantly busy. Um, they, you know, Teams calls back to back on a daily basis. We are being very productive. It certainly helped us uh, a great deal. Um, I think we're also communicating more frequently as as a team uh, and in better ways. You know, Mark mentioned WhatsApp. One of the things that um, certainly my, t my team has done has put together a WhatsApp group under the strict instruction um, that we only use it for non-work communication purposes. So we use Teams for all the work communication. We use WhatsApp for non-work purely to try and keep us um, sane uh, and to have conversations beyond the realms of work as we would do if we, if we were in the office. So various uh, images and cartoons, as you would imagine, being shared around just to try and keep that balance of um, of the mental well-being uh, in the time where we're all uh, forced to be working from home. Uh, in terms of program delivery, um, as I said, we'd already switched to Teams. The thing that did happen very, very rapidly was um, sort of demobilization from sites to a working from home situation. Um, some of our sites have continued to operate throughout. Um, so some of our clients, uh, we, we have to work. So, for example, water sector, you know, people need clean water, drinking water. They need the wastewater to be treated. So where we're working with water clients, uh, we have continued to operate, for example. Um, but under the uh, reduced capacity, social distancing, um, you know, some of the technology that's coming around that, you know, we're in a good situation. Costain, probably historically known best for being a construction company, but um, we're, we're more... Um, we're more focused at the moment on technology solutions for, for providing sort of end-to-end -end engineering um, solutions. So we have lots of technology solutions in place that allow us to, to implement that social distancing. Um, we've been able to um, sort of decamp uh, anybody that's working in the design teams or the BIM team. So I'm, I'm responsible for BIM and geospatial across the group. Um, I would say they've actually been very, very productive. Uh, it's worked very well. They've all um, been working from home. Design reviews have been conducted over Teams. It's not quite as easy to do because you haven't got a group of people all interacting around a single screen, being able to comment and review on things. It's all been done by hand in control. Uh, but productivity largely has been unaffected and in some ways it's actually been enhanced. A lot of the comments that I've had is it's um, it's actually nice not to be interrupted by people constantly coming over to the desk to, ask, to uh, ask for information and it's forcing people to actually go and look for that information themselves. So it's in a way, it's a, it's a strange education program that's going on at the moment with people knowing where to look for data, how to find it, how to use it without necessarily just relying on somebody to do it for them because they just happen to be sat next to them. Um, so I think what we are doing is capitalizing on the situation. Uh, trying to get ahead of the curve so that when all the sites do re uh, reopen and get back to full capacity, we'll be able to hit the ground running. Everything's going to be uh, at our fingertips. You know, all the design data will be up to date. We can get out on site and get cracking. Um, some interesting things that have come out of the situation. Uh, lockdown, obviously, with certain areas being closed to the general public or to traffic, for example. 
It's allowed us to get out and do things like laser scans, drone surveys, and do a whole load of data capture that typically uh, wouldn't be possible um, worth were sites operating or were locations operating to full capacity. So we've been able to actually go and capture that data. We haven't necessarily processed all of it yet, but we have got the data now at our fingertips should we need to. Um, and then hopefully it'll still remain current for when things reopen and we can get that generated and, and provided back. Um, I think what it has done, it's enabled our operations to continue with reduced capacity. And I think in, the interesting outcome of, of this may be that we see a smaller footprint of sites going forward. I think people have realized that when we are working from home, we do actually mean we're working from home. You know, previously, I think there was a little bit of a stigma attached to working from home. Are you really working? Are you watching daytime television? Uh, we've proved that we do work from home. We've proved that we work very, very hard and very efficiently and to uh, to some extent more productively. And I think that will continue. We may well see um, smaller office uh, offices on sites, potentially with uh, the likes of design managers only visiting rarely with a hot desk rather than being person based permanently on site. And I think that will also positively contribute to things like the uh, the climate change agenda. Fewer people traveling to site, less pollution, less congestion, uh, less water uses, less electricity consumption on site, for example. So there could be some positives that come out of it for that. Um, I think the other thing is um, that we're really hoping that uh, clients and owner operators uh, use the opportunity to understand exactly what data it is that they need to completely operate as a business. You know, it's a perfect example. You've not got anybody there. Everything's gone into shutdown. We don't have a certain set of information. It'd be great to know that at the moment people are actually updating their asset information requirements, for example, as we come to understand through an enforced mechanism, the actual importance of the data that we really need to keep things operational, uh, certainly in terms of critical national infrastructure. So I think it's a huge opportunity um, to accelerate digital working. Um, I do think there'll be a better work-life balance for some. And I also think um, that the situation where you know, a, a perceived construction company can work from home and work well from home may actually um, attract a broader range of people into the industry, people that don't necessarily want to work on site but associate construction with that kind of activity may now be thinking, well, I, I could work from home and that's something I could be doing. Um, and I think as well, it's also going to drive a faster pace of digital transformation uh, and innovation in infrastructure. Um, I think if people don't adapt now, the pace of change that we've seen over the last eight, eight weeks of lockdown, um, it's not going to be something that completely goes back to normal. You know, I know, for example, um, all of our um, future board meetings, it's been stated, will be teams based because it's far better to have everybody online than half the people in the room and half the people online. So every board meeting will be online. I do think some face-to-face -face meetings will uh, come back. I think that's just inevitable. But I do think the way that we work, the way that we treat technology, the appreciation, the understanding of what technology can bring, um, you know, remote monitoring of sites, that kind of thing, getting that information in without necessarily needing to visit, I do think it's going to try uh, drive that big change uh, more quickly than maybe it would have done. Uh, and I think everybody's going to have to embrace that um, or potentially uh, those that don't may be in trouble. Back to Andy. That's great. Thanks. Thanks very much. Again, some really interesting insights there about, um, you know, cost in an organisation that had already embarked on and was quite far, you know, down the, you know, down the line of, um it's it's digital journey i suppose but you know what we've seen in the recent period that's probably accelerated matters as far as your organization's concerned and in many ways is now beginning to change the way that the company works and interesting what you said there about um you know board meetings uh, it's an interesting one for um you know organizations that re represent other organizations you know will boards move into a virtual environment will there ever be international meetings again you know all of these questions that uh, you know will need to uh, need to be looked at um our final speaker on the panel just before we open things up for questions and the questions are already coming in so please do keep posting your questions um if you um if you want to mention your firm uh, where you have one or your, or, or your job title then please feel free to put that in the chat because it's not immediately apparent uh, when you put that in, you don't have to, but if you want to, then 
I'm more than happy to uh, to give that a mention. Our next speaker, aforementioned representative organisations, and I think we're really um, chuffed and pleased to have um, Hannah Vickers, the Chief Executive of the Association for Consultancy uh, and Engineering on the, uh, on the panel. Uh, for those that aren't aware, but I'm sure many of you will be because you've been reading assiduously the reports uh, on the ACE website and also on infrastructure intelligence. Hannah has been playing quite a leading role in the pan-industry response to the uh, to the COVID crisis, and 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 uh, um, Hannah has got wide experience um, of just how the industry has been trying to grapple with some of these issues as we sort of start to move into um, a new normal. So I'm sure that. Um, uh, her insights will be well worth hearing. So, Hannah, over to you. Thank you very much, Sandy. And given that you're both pleased and chuffed, I'm hope, on the panel. I hope I don't let you down. Um, so, I'm going to take a slightly different um, perspective from our speakers so far, um, because I'd like to look a little bit further ahead and actually look outside the businesses at some of the lasting changes uh, we might see and how that's going to impact on us in construction to so almost a kind of look back into construction from outside. Um, I think there's probably three areas where there's going to be lasting change um, as a result of the pandemic that will change how we work and perhaps give us a new normal. Um, those three things are, I think it's going to change the demand um, on us in terms of what we're, we're building. Uh, it's going to change our processes and our ways of working, some of which has been touched on already, but I'll, I'll bring a couple of other thoughts to that. Uh, and lastly, it's going to completely disrupt our mechanisms and ways in which the industry is funded and financed, uh, both in terms of our project pipeline, but actually in terms of how businesses are financed as well. So um, I'll just spend a few minutes on each of those, just giving a few thoughts on, and this is very much a personal um, sort of perspective, but uh, some thoughts around how I think those, those things are going to change the, the world of construction um, looking back in. So starting with demand, um, we can see already it's been very interesting um, working closely with government to look at where they are prioritising, how even though it appears at the moment we're in the grip of the crisis, they're already thinking with their policy decisions further ahead. And the number one um, policy priority for the government at the moment is jobs, protecting jobs, retaining jobs in the UK. All of their policies really lead back to that, however they're positioned. Um, so if we kind of extend that out into the wider sector um, and think about really what's the economy going to look like going forward, this temporary disruption, this temporary different way of working will have fundamentally shifted um, how we're going to be using our built environment, what we're going to be expecting from it going forward. So, for example, the sorts of things I think we might see disrupting our markets would be we've already seen a big spike in demand for data centres and the supporting infrastructure that we need to work in this different way. We're perhaps going to see less demand for commuting infrastructure. We're perhaps going to see much more sort of community and local infrastructure coming to the fore, increased leisure, increased health centres, increased education facilities. All of that is starting to take shape in the plans for the government's recovery um, from COVID. So in terms of our markets, you can see some really interesting disruptions happening there. You know, a big focus on infrastructure and the built environment that supports mental health. You know, thinking about how we need to replace social contact at work if we're working remotely more with things like sort of community business hubs. You know, all of this, not less demand, but just different demand on our infrastructure, much more community focused and perhaps having, you know, better local communities, better um, homes for working from home in, better, you know, offices that we can commute to so that we can get out of our homes but don't involve you to travel you know Manchester to London for a meeting more sort of almost business tourism hubs being created so actually you still have the space to come together and collaborate but you're not doing it in your office where you own the space so big disruptions to the um, to the built environment and consequently big disruption potentially to what we will be asked to design and build um, in the construction sector and I think we need to think about that and not get too fixated on just thinking about, you know, looking at our big thinking about what happens within our own business. It's almost, this is happening to all of the businesses across the economy. How does that feed back into our market? So I know it's business to start thinking about that um, and start positioning themselves and looking at their future offerings to clients um, in that space. Which sort of brings me quite neatly onto the second um, topic around process 
So we've touched on some of the different ways of working, how we can work better um, collectively using digital tools. But actually, I think we can go beyond that and think you know, almost more fundamentally about how we can change some of our processes. Um, an example of that um, would be how we can make the planning process more resilient uh, and more productive, shall we say. We know that planning is not a quick, dynamic process as it stands at the moment. It's quite traditional and actually very important that it's, you know, it has its proper sort of um, legal and democratic uh, responsibilities. But we've seen already there have been, even in that, perhaps the most, you know, um, staid and conservative of processes around our industry. We've seen some movement. We've seen planning committees meeting virtually. We've seen changes to the governance structure, which actually put planning decisions uh, and the sort of speed at which planning decisions are made around things like the Nightingale Hospital on a fast track. They've been able to flex in response to the changing priorities of, um, of society. So I think we need to sort of capitalise on that and look at how we can do things like digitising the planning process to make it more resilient um, to these sorts of uh, disruptions, but also to make it more productive for the long term, that we don't revert back to having paper-based, um, you know, sort of face-to-face -face meetings in a very staid, um, you know, process that doesn't really respond to the, the risks that are coming out of society. So I think it's definitely something there. You could apply the same logic to thinking about uh, increased uptake of off-site manufacture and platform uh, processes. Both of those have huge potential to increase our productivity, to increase our resilience, you know, having well-defined processes that you do over and over again are easier to make those sort of uh, COVID secure to use the government's language than actually having to bespoke it every time you're on a construction site doing something different. So that would cover our, you know, some thoughts there around how our processes might need to be redesigned. And in that, you'll find new ways and new service lines for the clients. You know, there's all sorts of processes in there that actually in this period of disruption, clients wouldn't have even thought that they needed, but that you could bring online and offer to them. So I think that's really important to be thinking about that um, as far as the businesses go. And the last one is, is funding and finance. So unsurprisingly, coming out of this, um, we're going to be in a position where the public finances have taken quite a hit. Um, we're also going to be looking at very different levels of unemployment. We're going to be looking then at this sort of cycle of lower tax revenue. So it's going to be harder to, to rebuild um, those sort of uh, public finances. So I guess ultimately for us, that's going to mean a big disruption to how um, infrastructure in the built environment is funded and financed. I think although the government will never admit it, um, that PFI could come back. I think we're going to need to be cleverer about how we think about blending um, public funding and using that as a catalyst for, for private investment and private finance. And that goes all the way from, you know, how we do that in the built environment with um, things like development corporations leading those place-based strategies into actually how the businesses might be operating and might be financed themselves. You know, we've heard in the, the Financial Times that the government will consider taking a public stake in significant companies. Now you could quite easily see that some of our companies in construction would definitely fall into that category. So are we going to see these sort of slightly strange nuanced, you know, combined governance structures where public and private finance and investment come closer together? Um, so again, that's something I think we need to, to keep an eye on, start to understand, and again, almost look at how we position ourselves as a sector because there's so much that we could be the catalyst of there bringing together those um, funding and finance streams because we understand the risks, because actually going through the construction process is one of the more expensive, more risky parts of the built environment and the overall sort of asset creation. So again, I think, you know, more for businesses to start thinking about how that will play out in your particular markets and actually in your particular um, business situation and be creative and be uh, bold in what you're thinking. Um, so that was what I wanted to cover, Andy. I hope that gives some food for thought. That's great, Hannah. Thanks very much for that. I mean, I think there's some really interesting things there. And, and one of the most interesting things for me was how government are viewing the current situation and what their priorities are. And also, what is the effect going to be going forward on society as a whole? And I think this concept of community uh, business hubs is quite an interesting one. I seem to remember, I think it was the Scottish Futures Trust did something along those lines a few years ago. And um, are they going to sort of, you know, mushroom uh, in the uh, in the new normal? I think that's, you know, something that we can, you know, certainly think about uh, in the uh, in the discussion. Um, the, the the other thing that immediately flows in my mind from that is our local planning um, regulations sort of up to dealing with that 
and, and, and having a lot of those mushrooming left, right and centre. And what's the role of local authorities in all of that as well? So I think there's some interesting points uh, there. Speaking of interesting points, we've had some brilliant questions already. So do keep those coming. We'll try and get to most of them. Um, and I just want to ask the whole of the um, the whole of the panel one question to begin with um, uh, at the uh, uh, at the outset, and that's um, you know that's a question which I think focuses in in on um, you know what the new normal means um, you know for the industries you know people in uh, in particular and how that might actually develop. So a question uh, to all the panel. Um, starting with um, starting with Georgia, and that is um, a massive challenge. This is from Chris Taylor. A massive challenge moving forward that hasn't been talked about very much, although Georgia did mention it, is bringing young people into the workforce with the new digital landscape that Mark's talking about. You know, bringing uh, you know those you know digital um, you know sort of um, natives really into the um, in, into the workforce. How do we address that challenge, and how do we really make a beeline for those kind of people and bring them in. Georgia? Well, I think fundamentally individuals that come into our in, that come into our industry join the infrastructure sector because they want to make a long lasting tangible difference and change in the way in which we're developing. It's not we bring those people in because that's what they look to do, that's what they will always want to do. And I I think that in order to do that with sort of the younger generation that are coming up, those that are perhaps in that are going through this currently whilst they're trying to undertake exams, GCSEs, A-levels, all the way up to university and even those that are currently job searching at the moment. For them, technology isn't a huge shift from the way that they work. They already have a lot of their modules online anyway when they're doing their working aspects, even from, a, from, a, from apprentices kind of sort of all the way through. I think that the attraction for them needs to be to see that the industry is looking to make a real difference in what we do. We're looking to bring in sustainability from the holistic side, from the well-being side, interlink it into the new challenges that technology will bring forward in order to be able to do that. And I don't think that this current situation will change that because we can, those individuals and the younger generation we're bringing up can adapt to that process. I don't see the onboarding itself isn't particularly won't, won't change that much you might not meet somebody face to face but a lot of the onboarding procedures that people go through are very much online courses they have to run through it's talking to people so you can still do that via teams or zoom or whatever platform your business uses and it's kind of really it's all about i think personally bringing in that greater level of communication now there is such a thing as, as over communicating with everybody but in this current climate we have to be more overly communicative than we would be usually you've got to be on you, you've got to be able to there to kind of mentor and bring them together but i can't see there being a shift in in how we in how we bring young people into it as long as we as the industry are pushing and driving and at the forefront and are really taking charge of that infrastructure revolution rather than letting it stagnate and continue as it may have done not picking up on net zero not understanding the drivers that are coming forward with the new with sort of the emerging generation that are moving in they want to see that support and that driver into net zero they want to see better work-life balance they want to see a well-being aspect they want to have technology that enables them to do their work and I think that's that's all things that, that the panel have discussed here already today and I'm sure we'll go into more detail and it may well be picking up on on Hannah's point that we start to have those community-based hubs that mean that actually you get a localized aspect for the individuals to be able to to, do, to sort of to be able to work and, and live at the same time without having to uproot their lives and move to a central hub city, be that London, Manchester, Leeds, wherever they might be. It's taking a much more holistic approach at not only infrastructure and, and how we bring in those sort of that emerging generation, but also more broadly in terms of how we as sort of the, the more seasoned professionals operate and how you can provide that support and mentorship to a, to a new joiner within your business to be able to encourage them to remain those that will go to tech companies you will still see a, a shift in that because there are multiple other other drivers there beyond just sort of the monetary remuneration that they have you tend to see a better sort of um you tend to get much more of a a focus on that person's well-being so they tend to get more days paid holiday they tend to get better benefits 
in terms of you know gym memberships bike schemes that sort of stuff which we do do but perhaps not as much as, as those techs as, as the big tech firms do so there, there will always be that that push and pull but we need to be attractive enough to those who want to make that long lasting change thanks very much georgia for that matt can i just ask you have you seen uh off the back of of, of this increase in use of digital and use of technology. Have you seen more younger people come into your organisation? Um, I would say we've got it's a similar number of younger people, but potentially in different areas. Uh, we're attracting uh, talent uh, with you know, a much more diverse background now. Um, I think you know some of the stuff that George has mentioned, things like the cycle to work and all that kind of stuff, those different schemes, again, we do have, it's the perception the, the perception barrier that I think we need to get around that actually working in in this environment creating something you know some fairly spectacular long lasting uh, building structures whatever you want to call them is actually um, a really good thing to get involved with it's something that you want to be passionate about doing um, and I think as soon as we can change the perception that working in the industry is not meaning that you are on site digging a hole and pouring concrete at seven o'clock in the morning in the pouring rain then we're going to attract that different talent and i think that is i think that is changing if you if you look at things like you know we've, we've recruited games designers fairly recently who i think liked computer games trained to do 3d modeling 3d graphics realized once they'd left school or university that maybe the games industry was a bit more cutthroat than they anticipated and perhaps didn't pay as well as they thought it was going to pay and that breaking into it and getting a job in that space was more difficult than maybe they anticipated um, they hadn't realized that there was an opportunity to work in our industry doing 3d modeling 3d designs getting involved in putting together um, you know coordinated 3d model adding functionality to those models to simulate well, how they're going to perform effectively taking the games industry into into the infrastructure industry um, as soon as they realize that um, it's it's a complete shift you know we have unity programmers we have games designers working for us um, but it's actually making people aware that those opportunities exist that I think is the biggest challenge because it's not somewhere you would necessarily go looking if you want to hunt for a job in that in that space and I think more broadly than that, you know, people do, you know, geography students to do to work on the geospatial um, applications, um, English graduates to work on the the work winning side of things, the tendering opportunities or the consultancy proposals, things like that, writing specifications, writing scopes. There's a there's a lot of opportunity out there, and I think, you know, we we run a graduate scheme, we run an apprentice scheme, we're looking at digital apprenticeships apprenticeships with various universities aimed. At graduates, but taking a graduate to a, to a, a more enhanced apprenticeship level, creating specific um, apprenticeships tailored for digital engineering or digital applications. Um, but it's making people aware. So I would say we still get, you know, it's a similar number of people that we're attracting into the industry, but it's a more diverse range. And the challenge I think that we face is making people aware of the opportunities that exist so that we can attract the best talent. Okay, thanks for that, Matt. I've got another question here from from Lewis McCormack, and I want to address this to uh, to Mark uh, from from Bentley. Um, others can feel free to chip in as well. But um, how will the construction industry adopt the digital tools that have been accelerated through the COVID nineteen crisis to adapt its practice going forward? Is is this the juncture? Asks Lewis at which things like remote monitoring become the new normal as we try to balance productivity with social distancing. What's your thoughts on that, Mark? I think very much so. I think we were on a, a, a path that was leading to you know, digital transformation and adoption and this enforced sort of um, working from home, which is escalated. Uh, just pick up on, on Matt said, you know, I've been a home worker for at least six years now. And, you know, there was always that mindset: if you're working from home, you're, you're watching daytime telly in, in the background, and you know, maybe not being as productive as, as ever. My personal feeling at the moment: the days seem longer and the weeks seem shorter, as it is back-to-back -back meetings from eight till eight, and then your your admin kicks in late after that. Um, and also, I found people want to engage more. So I think what we need to do is take. You know, any silver lining out of this event 
which is you know picking up with what Georgia and Hannah and Matt have said about greater communication, that ability to now you know, I've got clients and people who I've had meetings with them, you know, previously it would have just been a, a quick phone call. Now people are very much open to that video chat, that expression on the face can still be read. And I do think we're at that junction where you know, software is available that will help this remote working, will engage with other people, and will also open up the market, especially in the consultancy sector, to, to people to, to come into this that have been maybe been put off by the way you know construction has that dirty image. So um, you know, maybe you know those, those people that were on the cusp of, of thinking about it will now actually say, I can you know, work from home, I can deliver this. But also you know, the, the big you know, push at the moment is the carbon zero and carbon neutral to actually give some sort of um, own emphasis and own responsibility to delivering that. Thanks, Mark. It's interesting, you know, you mentioned the, the net zero issue and there's been a lot of talk uh, of late that I've uh, detected in and around the industry about the kind of projects that are going to be um, looked at going forward. And I'm mindful of the fact that Hannah spoke about the government's priority at the moment is looking at jobs and job retention and potentially, I suppose, job creation. But Hannah, do you have any observations on whether we will see uh, a big increase in, I suppose, green infrastructure going forward? M maybe it's something to do with the fact that we've been really focused on well-being because of this health crisis and maybe people are thinking about the environment uh, a bit more. Have you detected anything along those lines? Um, yeah, I think so. And I think there's, there's going to be two, there's going to be two drivers. There's going to be sort of, you know, public um, expectations and how things will land with society. And actually, you know, you can see so much more appreciation for our kind of, you know, social care sector. And actually, a, I think a much bigger discussion happening um, around people's mental health and their well-being. So all of that, I think will mean that if you're trying to um, say please voters, you're going to be already looking at things that are you know more in that space, be it environmental, be it to meet the you know the sort of society's appetite for, for net zero, but also I think you know kind of second to that is going to be this looking at actually what is the infrastructure that really helps people's well-being, and uh, you know that you could see a lot of the green infrastructure falling into that category. So again, if you're thinking about um, what might land well with the public, which is going to be, I think, what drives a lot of our decision making going forward, I could definitely see uh, an increase in that versus perhaps things like commuting infrastructure, um, which you could see that sort of some of the members of the public would think, well, that's why, why do we need that? We're not, you know, we're perhaps not as keen on that now. We're more interested in things that really help us um, live our lives in a way that you know we're going to be doing a quite a quite different way to how we went into this um, and I guess you know sort of in parallel to that if you're thinking about where you're going to get best value for your money uh, in terms of investments again right now if you want you know you'll go for two things you'll go for something which which pleases the public which is what I've just covered but also something that gives you decent value for money and actually the demand on a lot of the big economic infrastructure projects will be quite hard to articulate and hard to estimate going forward. So again, that immediately means that if you want to put a fiscal stimulus in to help the construction sector, you're going to want to probably put it into things where you're going to be quite confident there's going to be demand. And you know, net zero is not going away. Um, biodiversity more broadly is still going to be a priority um, for you know for, for the government and for the society going forward. So I would suggest, and this is just a suggestion, I think that we're more likely to see um, sort of uplift and investment in that kind of infrastructure in the pipeline that delivers that. Than we would have been, say, perhaps coming out of the last recession when it was all about, you know, big flagship infrastructure projects driving um, the sort of economic value as a, you know, as the, as the main driver. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks for that. I'll, I'll come back to what government should be doing and also what the industry should be doing to actually push government to do stuff uh, a little bit later. But I just want to sort of sort of reflect back onto the effects on our own sector really for a second. And, and there's an interesting question from, from Robert Isles, um, who's, who I hope I pronounced his name right, it could be Illis, but anyway, um, he said the trade press is full of a innovation, is a catalyst to innovate and transform, adopting new methods, digital, et cetera. But we needed to do this anyway. In your view, how does the current situation 
exacerbate this need for change, especially when people and large organizations are struggling to survive, let alone thinking about investing in innovation or change. And I think what Robert's potentially saying there is obviously there's going to be a few economic challenges going forward. So when firms are just looking to survive, um, you know, how are they going to innovate? There's probably a kernel of an answer in, in what I've just said there. But Georgia, what's your thoughts on that? I mean, I think the the industry needed to change anyway. There, there was a there, there was a view prior to this that in order to get to where the future of consultancy needed to be, we need to go we we needed to go through a huge transformational change to be able to deliver on what future projects were going to look like. I mean, change is never easy. No one likes change, but what we've proven and are continuing to do so is that we are we've been able to switch to a different way of working very quickly. We've been able to uptake different technologies that companies perhaps weren't looking to roll out. I think Matt said they'd started to roll out teams, but purely from a communication side, and now they're using it as a full sort of, as a, as a full working tool. I think from the, in terms of the, the, the struggle that companies might be, I think I'll leave that to more learning colleagues to be able to pick up on that one of my expertise doesn't lie there. But from a, from a people perspective, it was always coming. You could see it coming from from some clients. You could sort of there were there were sort of inklings of a pulling from government coming through, albeit not very strong. But I think that that's predominantly why the likes of the of AC's Future of Consultancy campaign launched was to sort of to ready the industry that this needs to change. We've got to do this in the next sort of three to five years to get this through. This has almost been a, a catalyst or a launch pad, if you will, to be able to then kind of escalate that and sort of challenge it in, in the right ways to be able to drive and, and, and push it forwards. There'll obviously always be economic questions associated with that in terms of how businesses can develop for their own and for their own people, but also to sort of to continue to prosper for themselves. But I don't I don't see this as a I see this very much as, as a positive challenge that we can embrace, but that we have to embrace as one industry, as one whole, that means we need to have the the consultancies, the the contractors, the clients on board with the direction in which we're going in to be able to support everyone to to get through this, and then to get through this in the right way, so that we're we're standing, fighting fit, ready to go with whatever our normal might be when and when it may return. Thanks, George. And Matt, do you have any um, observations on that? This whole question of, you know, when there's we're in extreme economic di difficulties that we might well end up going into. I mean, we don't want to overplay that, but I think we have to recognise that there are going to be some challenges. Uh, what are the, then the prospects for, you know, having a real investment in technology and digital? I mean, obviously, it's a process that Costain, I'm sure, have been through in the past. Mm. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you know, acquisitions that we've made recently, um, it's all about our strategic direction is technology and digital focus you know we've got at the moment we have something called digital cost day and we have cost day and digital so digital cost day is about business transformation across the whole of the group and then cost day and digital is about the the area of cost day that provides that uh that technology the technology solutions and the platform that everybody operates on and the services that we sell to to, to clients or to to make our projects more efficient so we've recognized that we you know we need to change the whole industry needs to change. We're trying to be, you know, ahead of that curve uh, and in repositioning and uh, refocusing what the organisation do. I think everybody's going to be in a similar, a similar situation. I think the the key thing for me, um, and I've seen this time and time again, it's about focusing on the value, not the cost. Um, you know, if you're going to spend ten thousand pounds on something, you've got to make sure that the value it brings is way more than just ten thousand pounds there's no point spending ten thousand pounds to save ten thousand pounds but if you spend a hundred thousand pounds and it can save you two hundred thousand pounds it's actually what what's the value that it's bringing we need to be able to 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 prove that but then that kind of leads to a different question about where you're making those savings so we know uh well we know we've got the facts we've got the numbers that by using technology on some of the bigger contracts that we are working on um, without naming names, we we've reduced certain headcount in certain areas because the technology can do the functions of you know, some of the resources that we're looking at. So we can make savings by applying technology. Um, is that the right thing to do? 
probably yes long term because you know everybody has to change and everybody has to adapt but it's all about you know we've proved now that we can make in one particular area six hundred thousand pound savings per year um we've got the evidence we know how to reproduce it and it's now demonstrating that to others that if they adopt the same approach um they'll be able to do the same and make the same kind of order of magnitude savings so it's really about making sure that you know if you are going to invest make sure you know what you're investing in and what the savings are going to be um, but i think it's down to us as, in, as an industry to capture those savings and communicate them and, and share them to, to make sure that we basically bring best value to the taxpayer <clears throat> thanks matt i've got a, another question about um exactly how we're going to be working going forward it's from morgan Haylett. And they say it appears across the industry that people who don't work on site can and should work from home for the foreseeable future. With the almost immediate move from large scale office premises to working from home, most home workers are probably making many compromises and are actually not working optimally. What responsibilities do or would companies have for providing for working from home infrastructure for their staff? And I'd like to pose that question in the first instance to um to mark as someone who, who obviously does work in from you know what should firms be doing to make sure and indeed in your experience are they doing so enabling their their staff to work efficiently from home i think it's uh, well the way we do it at bentley we um you know we have all of the technology and the you know to, to have the ability to work from home but it's very much that communication so we have a monday morning huddle where we uh, the team gets together you know, mainly actually discusses, as Matt said, with his WhatsApp, uh, you know, non-work related stuff, you know, how are we, what are we doing? And I think there is that, you know, that downside of working from home is that remote working, you know, that you are remote from people. Over the last sort of eight weeks, I've seen that dissipate and, and sort of slide away because people are more open. But the main thing for, for companies to support the staff is to, not isolate them it's you know mental health and mental aspects is to bring them to still feel part of that team and to support them you know with you know, i have a one-to-one -one with my line manager and we have a group huddle twice a week so i still feel very much part of the team even though i'm, I'm isolated uh and working remotely but you know that mental health support factor is a, is a key thing but just going back to the, the previous question on you know, going digital. I'm working with a particular client, but his words were now. Um, now is the time to go digital, if ever. Main reason being is it's not the cost of the actual software, it's the adoption. We can go out and we can spend thousands and thousands of pounds on the software. The actual critical part is the adoption of that software. And at the moment, people are in that mindset to change, alter, and move forward because they're actually seeing a positive benefit from themselves, quality of life, more time at home. So, you know, the investment actually, he's running a survey at the moment, but having launched software previously in the old norm and now launching software now in the new norm, what actually the, the ROI will be, and he's actually very confident the ROI will be higher because people actually don't want to get back to get on that commute train or, or the drive. So there are actually more emphasis to be greater success in supporting new initiatives. Thanks, Mark. I've got a question here that I think I'm going to address to Hannah, and it, it kind of speaks to this whole issue about what is the government's response going to be going forward and mindful of what you said about they're really strongly looking at job creation. It's a question from Richard Dobbs, and he says, should the government adopt a Keynesian approach to large infrastructure investment immediately? Why is nuclear new build? Northern Powerhouse, Crossrail 2, etc., being held up. Thoughts on that, Hannah? So I think it's a question of timing, not that it's not going to happen. Um, so if you look at the moment, the government's still focusing and has got to still focus on the sort of health, um, you know, health crisis. It will move to the economic recovery, I think, over the next few weeks. So I don't think it's not going to happen. I just think it's not yet. What I would say is I'd expect it to look quite different um, to the sort of um, Keynesian measures that came in after the last recession, uh, in part because of some of what I was saying earlier about the demand changing. You know, I think that they will be mindful of that and actually want to invest in infrastructure. You know, they've had a hell of a time with high speed two over the last few years. 
Um, I think they'll be very mindful that they don't really want to enter into that. They would rather, you know, pour infrastructure into things that are less controversial and therefore more likely to get onto the ground and do job creation um, more quickly. So I think we'll see some of that. I mean, something to look out for in that space is the um, Construction Leadership Council's recovery plan that's going to be published next week, because that's really the start of the conversation with governments about exactly what should be being put forward and what's feasible because the other thing that we've got to be mindful of is um you know it's, it's sort of a two-way street in that the government will be looking at those sorts of measures they're going to want to be confident that when they come out to the market with them we're going to have the industry there in terms of the capacity and the capability to deliver them um so you know if government were going offhand now and just starting to announce all sorts of you know big mega projects I would be quite nervous that actually it wasn't a well thought through coordinated plan and that is what I think we're working towards but um, I said this, the conversation should start um, next week so maybe just a, a watch this space I don't think it's a, a no but maybe just a not right now. Well we'll obviously be looking keenly out for that uh, recovery plan because clearly that, that's going to contain a lot of information that you've you just signalled there and we'll, we'll obviously anticipate that. Just sort of following on from that and this is one for uh, initially for Georgia, but I think I'll broaden it about uh, out to the rest of the panel. There's been a lot of talk about transport going forward and what that might look like. Um, obviously, at the minute, you know, people are, you know, I think they're quite nervous about using any kind of public transport in particular. Um, and what might that might mean for the future? I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that our sector has done pretty well out of transport projects. Is the transport infrastructure that we're going to be looking at going forward uh, or projects, is that going to look a bit different to what we've seen hitherto? Georgia, do you have any thoughts on that? I think it will definitely look different to, to what we've seen to date. I think what we'll probably see, as Hannah sort of mentioned in a previous answer, is there'll be much more of a drive towards green infrastructure and green transport infrastructure. So we're already seeing that the government are making provisions for, for more pedest to pedestrianise more places, to upgrade pedestrian as aspects. Um, certainly within London, there's been a, a greater push towards enhancing cycle lanes in order to be able to provide that green transportation for people to use. Discussions around the things like those um, those micro scooters that are um, in that grey area of, of pedestrian or, or, or motorised vehicle, but discussions around how do you encourage more people to use those so you're keeping them off transport, they're staying socially distant, but they're able to commute to work or commute to see other people. And I think that the focus on on infrastructure and, and transportation infrastructure that enables people to get back to the, mu the much more social aspect, let alone moving into the office, but being able to meet friends, meet family and actually travel around to see people that means they're not in a confined space. I think that that green transportation infrastructure will, will come in much more apparent. In terms of sort of the sort of car use and things like that if we can continue to drive and, and to create better infrastructure moving forwards that it will it will link through and be able to kind of develop that in a much more sort of focused manner for in terms sort of for, for trains and aspects like that we're seeing already that um train companies train lines airplanes i think mark might have alluded to it previously in terms of the work that they're doing from a digital and from a technology basis to be able to improve what that will look like will support in people getting back into transportation in the more traditional sense as we knew it pre-covid but there, i think that there, there really needs to be a focus particularly within the big cities in terms of how we can create that better green infrastructure to encourage that that well-being from an exercise point of view we know that exercise is positive for your well-being so it kind of sort of promotes that mental well-being aspect of it but also will then achieve not only sort of the drive towards net zero as as sort of a country and individual cities but also to kind of support our industry to be able to think of different and innovative ways to be able to, to develop what this will look like with local planning authorities. Mm, thanks George and interesting that you you, you touched on the mel mental well-being issue there because I think there's been a lot of um talk within the industry particularly over the last couple of months about you know people being uh, you know cared for I suppose who, who've mm -hmm. been working from home and what that actually looks like um, I've got a question in here from Melanie M Manton who says with working from home will that mean you have to monitor exercise levels of staff um, you know that's the first thing and and and, and is there a you know, does it create even more responsibility on firms to address this whole question 
of mental well-being. So I don't know whether Matt's got a view on that. Have you had to take that on board in terms of the, the recent period? Um, I wouldn't say at the moment that we're monitoring exercise levels of staff. We're certainly encouraging it. <laughs> um, whether it will be something that we have to do in the future, I, I don't know. You could argue there's a you know there's a corporate responsibility angle to that. If people are going to be working from home, making sure that they do take the breaks, that they do move around. Um, I think at the moment it's more about encouraging rather than monitoring. Uh, simple things like making sure that people can, you know, this, this sounds crazy, but making sure people can put teams on their mobile phones has been one of the things that we've been really pushing so that you're not sitting in front of a laptop all day, every day, so you can actually get up and go out into the garden, walk around and still be on that phone call if you really have to take it. Um, you know, we've done things in the past like um, provide pedometers to people so that we can do monthly challenges of how far you're walking in, in, in a month and everybody competing with each other and things like that. Um, and uh, like George has mentioned, things like cycle to work schemes. I do think there's a certain onus on individuals to, to look after themselves to a degree. Um, but certainly, I, I think it's something that will be, if, if not monitored, then certainly actively encouraged and enabled i think will probably be an enabler of uh, daily exercise from home rather than necessarily enforcing or, or monitoring it i would think thanks for that just a, another question again about what this new normal might look like i mean a lot of people you know are saying yeah the it's potential that the the office based uh, industry and business is potentially going to be a thing of the past but i mean is that really going to be the case are we really looking at as someone I think said in the FT quite recently, the death of the office. Uh, what happens when people get back and we get back to some sort of normality? Isn't it inevitable that people are just going to drift back into, you know, the way they've always worked and they're going to get on the tube and they're going to commute cheek by jowl with other people, et cetera, et cetera. Hannah, what, I mean, has there been any thought, that, you know, within the industry more widely about what that means? What are you hearing on the grapevine from, you know, some of the big consultancies that maybe you've got massive offices? Are they, are they, are they really gonna you know move away from from office based working so i think well, what you know well, what's going to be going through the mind of the business they're going to want to to do things that are popular with their staff you know you don't want to force people to drag themselves across london squash onto tubes and then get into an office um if actually all you're going to have is a lot of protesting staff potentially people leaving and, and just generally it's really going to impact morale so i think there's you know there's there is some thought around what people's appetite is to actually return to the office. Um, and then secondly, there is always a kind of cost consideration to it because offices are quite expensive, you know, particularly if you have got big tower blocks in the center of London or you've got city based offices where, you know, historically you would have had that um, for your staff, but also for some of your client engagement. Now, I don't think it's going to be a sort of wholesale. None of us are ever going to have offices, but I think there's going to be a greater degree of flexibility introduced absolutely for the reasons that I've mentioned people are going to be you know more sort of open to working from home um, because some of the well-being benefits some of the fact that they don't have an hour's commute each way you know it saves them money it saves them time in their day so I think you know it's going to be as far as staff are concerned I think businesses will face pressure to not be expecting them all to be back in the office nine to five Monday to Friday um, and then secondly, you know, so the, you know, the kind of the cost angle to that isn't insignificant. You know, if you do a lot, if you took the investment that you currently put into your office space and actually put that into investing in your staff, investing in your staff's training, or maybe even just having less fixed office space, but keeping it for accommodation and doing more, you know, sort of away days team building, um, which kind of hits, you know, sort of two angles in terms of improving productivity, improving morale and potentially not costing you any more money than just you know paying for a box in the center of london so i do think there will be changes and i hope that that the businesses are thinking of those through through the, those sorts of lenses really rather than just a cost angle thanks for that hannah I just got a, another interesting one i mean this industry has always prided itself on being an international industry you know both in terms of the work that it does overseas and also um you know the the, the talent pool that it actually draws its workforce from but going forward is it the case that we might be looking towards um not just the industry but the country even being a little bit more i don't want to use the word insular but i can't think of a better word as we as, as maybe horizon horizons get a little bit narrowed because people you know have a little bit of a fear about travel potentially 
And that's before you even factor in things like the, you know, the, the government's new immigration rules and so on and so forth. So are we going to see more of a focus on local uh, rather than international? I don't know what people think about that. Mark, do you have a view on that? Could you just unmute yourself, Mark? Sorry, um, I think um, as Hannah alluded earlier, I think you know regional has always been this sort of a comment of you know city centric events or London centric events. I think you know with with the the, the infrastructure will change. I and mean, ironically, you know we talk about bike lanes and cycle lanes, and we put them in cities. We actually don't need bike lanes and cycle lanes in cities. We need them in rural areas. We have underground. We have buses in the city area actually in the rural area and that's where we actually need the cycle lanes so if we can enhance you know infrastructure rurally through projects then we go for a regional hub i do think the country could turn back in on itself and say yeah and how we then sort of promote construction to to, to young school leavers to, to work regionally work at home better quality of life um, lower carbon footprint because you're not having to go into a major city I think it could have a, a very positive effect on on the industry locally. Andy, I'd just jump in there. I think sort of taking a, a, a slightly more um, slightly more wider view of that. I don't know if, if many of the listeners saw, but McKinsey published a, a sort of their, their thought piece um, late last week, sort of looking at titled diversity wins. And I think one of the benefits of what we're looking at with, with lockdown and, and where we are now is that our industry is possibly becoming much more attractive to those that would never have come into infrastructure, would never have perhaps felt uncomfortable going into an office-based location, didn't like being around a lot of people. Now they're at the point where they're able to work at home. We're going to see a much bigger uptake of sort of, of that's DEI, diversity, equity and, and inclusion from that. And I think that that can very much also be the fact that we can now pull on, we can demonstrate to clients that we're already working successfully in lockdown, but now we can actually start to pull on skill sets that are based in other parts of the globe to be able to work on these projects rather than it having to be somebody who's say based in manchester working on a manchester project actually now that we can work from home and we can do this perhaps this broadens out the talent pool and broadens out the the different sorts of people that, that we can bring into our businesses you could have somebody based in you know the rural Ohio working on a project in, in, in Manchester if their skill set is is specifically to do with uh, that particular piece of infrastructure and you need that person in there they could do that without having to spend the cost to come over to do the to have the flight travel to do all of that extreme example but we already know that a, certainly a, a lot of the large consultancies have what they sort of global excellence centers based in either in sort of eastern europe or over in india or in the philippines and we're starting to see sort of a lot more of those come through and i think it will increase that level of diversity and the inclusion of different individuals we can bring into our industry to support the development of, of what we need to do as, as we move forward out of lockdown i think another thing i'd add to that would be um I don't know about more insular. I think it's made certainly, certainly my the company I work for. I think it's made us more tolerant. Um, you know, previously you'd be on a phone call with somebody working from home. There'd be a, a baby running around in the background or a dog barking or whatever it happened to be. You don't bat an eyelid anymore. And hopefully going forwards, that's you know, that'll be something that continues because I think things like that in the past have historically been one of the reasons why people feel like they can't work from home because of having to deal with children. And I think now it's more, it's just become accepted and, and normal. You know, we're juggling the job and the childcare and the dog walking or wherever it happens to be. You know, so many people have said, you know, they get out at 7.30, they walk the dog, then they do some work because they haven't driven somewhere. And it's been fantastic. We've had people on video calls with a baby on their lap. Nobody cares. We just get on and, we just, and we've just been working. And if that happens to continue, I think, I think that'll be a really good thing. I think that's a really good point, actually. And I think we've all got our stories where we've, you know, had sort of Zoom calls, maybe not like the one where the MP, I think he went to the toilet in his shorts and he got caught on camera. Obviously not a good look there. But I think you're right. I mean, I had a call the other day and there was someone, you know, with their young child running around the background. You just you, you don't think about it. It's interesting. I think that even that kind of dynamic changes the way that you think about the people that you're doing business with. Uh, you know, I think that's really, really interesting. You wouldn't have necessarily seen that uh, in the past. I just want to come back, though, on this 
question just as we start to bring to 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 wrap things up the points that georgia was raising there is there a contradiction between the industry and it's not just confined to construction obviously but this i suppose on one level kind of newfound realization that you can have people from anywhere i know our industry was always working like that but we've seen it enhanced i think in the recent period with the use of these digital tools but is there a contradiction between being able to have people working on projects from all over the world and that real need going forward to create jobs in the industry and to create, I suppose, dare I say it, even UK jobs, which will be the government's agenda going forward. How do we balance that? Or is that something that we don't need to worry about as an industry? And maybe that's one for the industry to look for the for the government to look at. I don't know whether Hannah has any observations on that in terms of the job creation. I'm not trying to put you in. Um, you know, heaven forbid, Boris Johnson's shoes. I, I wouldn't dream of doing such a thing. But, you know, do you have any observations on that, Hannah? No, I think it's, it's going to be a really interesting challenge because, as you say, what we're going to need is some of the, you know, the best skills. Um, and we've got the ability to be able to access those from anywhere in the world. But you have to square that against actually we're going to be looking at rising unemployment. Um, so I think it will be, like I said, it will be, it'll be a sort of policy challenge, if you like, for government to try and address that. Um, I think that they're not so closed minded that they will go completely nationalistic and the, you know, every pound going into infrastructure has got to support a UK job. Um, I think they'll see beyond that. And certainly if we look at, you know, for example, like our, our universities and how they're seen as in, you know, investing um, in the universities and supporting them because, they want to draw the best talent from around the world to those universities to study, to create that sort of, you know, community um, of, of learning and best practice coming out of it. So I think there'll be there'll be more of that kind of mindset. Um, there will definitely be a focus on things that will create UK jobs. Uh, and there will obviously be, you know, if you're creating physical infrastructure, yes, there are certain elements of it that can be done around the world. But actually, you know, by and large, you're probably going to be building it on site or very near to site and transporting it, even if it's off site. So you know, as far as we're concerned, I think as an industry, we're perhaps less vulnerable to that than, than others. Um, and so I think on that basis, it's very easy for the, you know, a kind of basic policy level to draw a line between, you know, money going into the infrastructure and construction pipeline and UK jobs being created because they're there, because it's that, you know, it is place based. Um, so I think, yeah, it's something we need to think about, but I suspect the government will have a bigger challenge in other sectors than they will do in ours um, on that basis. And actually that may benefit us because, you know, as at our basic level, if we can be more of a sort of guaranteed th route through um, than other sectors, for example, the aerospace where you've got huge supply chains all across the, the world that, you know, every pound government pours into that, they, they can't be that sure that, that, you know, even part of it is going to stay in the UK. Um, so I, yeah, I think we could we can probably um, do a, do a bit of both. Get the best talent from around the world, recognising that the vast majority of spend in our sector is still going to be supporting UK jobs. Thanks for that, Hannah. Um, we've just got the five minutes left uh, before we, we we finish, and I'm just going to ask our panelists. Uh, I'm going to give them a paragraph. I'm not going to give them a sentence because that would be unfair. So I'm going to give you a paragraph. So you'll have to get good with your punctuation here. And, and the question I'm going to ask is, if there was maybe one thing or, a, uh, you know, just maybe a, a couple of things, what do you think the main changes will be from the new normal going forward for, for, for um, post-COVID in terms of our sector is concerned? What do you think the main differences will be? And I'm going to kick off uh, with, uh, with Mark first. Uh, I think it's going to be the main thing is going to be the use of new technology and actually as the adoption, as I said earlier, the adoption of, of that new technology will actually enhance the expansion of it, i.e. the development. You know, Teams, when you started off as four screens, four people, very quickly it becomes nine plus. So the more adoption, the more research, the greater data, so the greater, uh, greater the inclusion of new technology, I think will be the the main thing that will come out of this. Inclusion, technology, implementation. Matt, again, in a paragraph, if you can manage it, um, what do you think the, the, the main changes will be? Uh, I'll try and do a couple of things. I think in terms of construction, I think the biggest change will be a greater amount of consideration up front as to 
how big a site compound needs to be or indeed whether we actually need one and I think in terms of technology I think it will be a greater reliance and acceptance on the importance that technology plays in the role of delivering infrastructure projects. Thanks for that. Georgia. I think echo Mark and Matt in that the digital adoption of, of, of the tools and, and the greater acceptance of that moving forward will be huge. I think what we'll start to see as well is, is an enhanced workplace experience when whether when we do eventually go back to whatever the offices will look like, that will certainly have much more of a focus around around sustainability, around well-being, around collaboration in, in ways that we've never done so before. And I think it would also give us the opportunity to have the right person in the right place at the right time for a project that's coming through to develop skills that are needed as, as, as we move forward. Great. And finally, Hannah. Uh, so I think we need to be very aware that what we're being expected to deliver is going to change. Um, so we can get very fixated on the processes and the how we deliver. Um, I think we need to be mindful that what we're going to be asked to deliver is going to change. It's going to be more focused on communities and on creating value um, for those rather than creating an asset for the sake of creating an asset. So I think that and then the sort of ramifications of that in terms of actually how can digital help us in that value creation how can what does that mean in terms of the skills profile shifting um, to focus on value creation rather than the process and the technicalities um, and then uh, lastly how do our business models need to flip um, to align to that value creation rather than you know playing your part in a process i think all of that will start to drag us forward um, into, into sort of a more modernized version of the industry Thanks very much for that, Hannah, and, and, and thanks very much indeed to all of our panellists um, this morning. In fact, obviously it's the afternoon now. Um, so a big, big, big thank you to Georgia Hughes, to Mark Coates, to Hannah Vickers and to Matt Blackwell for their um, thoughts and observations during the course of this first infrastructure intelligence uh, coming out of COVID um, webinar. I'd also like to thank as well, obviously, our attendees who've stuck with us throughout uh, for some brilliant questions as well. We've noted all the questions, impossible for us to get to them all, but they will be used to inform what we do in the remainder of our uh, webinar series. We'll also be sending a feedback form out, so do please fill that in because that will help us make sure that the content of these events is what you want it to be as well. Next Friday, um, it's Infrastructure Intelligence Friday again, we've got another webinar and this is on the role of infrastructure investment in kickstarting the economy. There's already getting on for 200 people have registered for that particular event. And we're going to have some really interesting observations uh, at that webinar, including about public opinion. Hannah spoke earlier about the different kinds of infrastructure that we might be looking at delivering because the, the demand will, will change. We've got some really fascinating research from Ipsos Mori about what people think about infrastructure going forward and are we going to be looking at the, at the same old same old or are we going to look at look, looking at something uh, something different and also future events in the series we've got about one about industry resilience going forward we've also got one about changing business models which i know is something very close to uh, to hannah's heart in relation to the future of consultancy campaign if you're not up to speed on that get over to the ac website and look at the future of consultancy um, section of that site and obviously the future of consultancy um, infrastructure hub on our own uh, on our own website so we look forward to people regist registering for all of those events going forward a big big again thank you to all of our panelists and we look forward hopefully to seeing you next friday and at suitable uh, and at future fridays going forward so thanks a lot and have a great friday and have a great weekend bye now <laughs>